Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine is bringing devastation and misery, with severe implications for European aviation. Huge areas of airspace closed, routes cancelled or lengthily rerouted. Today's strategic webinar with industry leaders to explore key impacts. Depressed stock markets, spiraling oil prices, titanium supply chain vulnerability, 10 billion euros in stranded leased airliners. Huge threats to aviation, just as European aviation looked to be on the path to post-COVID recovery. Good afternoon from Brussels and thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'm joined this afternoon with a distinguished panel of guests. First of all, I have Henry Colloy sitting here with me in Brussels, uh, Director General of MOVE in the European Commission. I have in Warsaw, Rafael Milczarski, the CEO of LOT um, Polish Airlines. And I have Rene Lujus, the CEO of Finnair Traffic, the ANSP of uh, Finland, all the way from Helsinki. So just to kind of start the ball rolling today, I think it's uh, worthwhile if we have a kind of a look at the general situation with traffic and how it has impacted on um, the, the crisis so far. So first of all, I think I just want to say at the outset that um, Ukraine is a member state of Euro control and we stand in full solidarity with Ukraine on everything. And that's right from every member of the staff here at Euro control. So I think it's important just to look at where we are. Before the closure, we had a situation where we had unfettered access at a cost, and this will come up later, of Russian airspace. And basically to get to Asia, you could go there and you can see it there quite clearly. After the closure, you now have to basically circle either to the south or to the north. And this is adding a lot of track miles for European airlines. So this is a really significant issue for European airlines as well. So that's the long haul. And, you know, when you look at it in detail, there's a couple of issues. First of all, today, uh, IATA reporting that the price of a barrel of J1 is approximately $140 a barrel. So f fuel prices are rising. We see this generally in the economy. And of course, all of the routes have become longer. And as a result, there's more fuel. So if you look at, say, Helsinki, and we have Rene with us here today, to Seoul, an extra 2,115 nautical miles. So on a return trip, you're looking at about 4.5 hours of, of that. And the same as the situation with Frankfurt, Paris, Charles de Gaulle and Amsterdam. So that's the first thing. So we have rising fuel and we have longer routes. The other thing, of course, is that what happens with the traffic in Europe? Now, obviously, nothing is flying in your Ukraine from a civil point of view at the moment but we're having to distribute the traffic. There's a different traffic pattern now that we don't have Ukrainian airspace. We don't really utilise Belarusian airspace at the moment due to sanctions. So we're seeing basically everybody having to route south or route north. And this is changing the pattern of European airspace and flights, uh, especially for the summer season coming up. So we're seeing a change in the way Polish airspace, a reduction of some flights in Poland, an increase in flights in Slovakia and in Romania, and some extra flights also in the um, Baltic Republic. So a wide variation of flights and very interesting from an ASP perspective. And I'm sure Rene will talk about that as well. You know, looking at the operations before the invasion, obviously we all had a number of weeks where flights were up and down. But who was operating? So basically... The largest airline in and out was Windrose Aviation, an internal operation, charters, followed by Ryanair, Ukraine, Whiz, and you can see all of the other airlines there. And the major routes, of course, were internal routes within the Ukraine, but Turkey, Poland, Egypt, Germany, Italy, these are important mar markets as well. So before the invasion, we had a pretty regular market, and I would say the UK, Ukraine aviation market was growing because we saw the low cost penetrating the market and this was very, very good for the general economy in Ukraine. So, you know, looking at the um, other impact and if we look at non-Russian operators, one of the other impacts we have to mention is that the sanctions are, don't apply to Chinese operators. So they're basically flying 
unfettered through the Russian Federation and we'll discuss that as well into Frankfurt, into Belgium each day flying cargo across the Russian Federation and of course there's the competitive advantage that that gives them over um, European airlines and that's something I'll be discussing with Henrik in, in a few moments as well. So these are key issues and then just to make a point that it's really important to remember that we also have a huge amount of um, assets that basically have been stolen uh, by the Russians. And what we're looking at is about 10 billion, over 500 aircraft seized uh, by the Russians and basically put on their register. And then, of course, this does give it a very difficult situation for European leasers and insurers as well. And that's something we'll discuss um, as well. So, you know, the the reality is, is that this is a number of, of side effects of the sanctions that we have to look at as well. Also, I just want to look at Aeroflot operations. And if you can see here, before the invasion, regular enough, the ups and downs each day, now virtually nothing, only operating to, to Turkey and basically nothing really else. So I think that effectively Aeroflot has ceased operations um, in Europe and that's a direct result of the, of the invasion. And you can see, for instance, if you look at the Russian Federation at the moment, realistically, only operating to um, Turkey and Azerbaijan and Armenia, very, very little flights. You can see the week of February and you can see how it's panned out there in the past. So that was before the invasion. And the last thing I just want to mention is that if we look at, you know, yesterday and we're looking at Russian airlines, they're now blocked from most of Europe. So really op operations are just in Kaliningrad, you know, Istanbul, um, Yerevan and some operations to um, Egypt. So very effective implementation of the of the sanctions. And one thing I would say as well is that Russian international flights are now only using Russian Russian owned aircraft outside Russia because, of course, they're worried that they, they will be seized. And uh, this is a very interesting thing to see that, you know, uh, leasers and everybody are looking to get their assets back if that's possible. So the other point and to kind of finish up is that when all these aircraft are in uh, Russia, and this is an issue we're discussing with IAS and, and with DG Move as well, is there now will be no sales. There'll be no maintenance. There's long term impacts. And what I mean is safety impacts for lack of maintenance, lack of MRO activity, lack of maintenance on engines. And there is a real safety implication for this um, going forward. So the kind of knock on effect of the sanctions, in my view, is that there'll probably have to be some safety actions. And I'm sure um, we'll get to discuss that as well. So basically, what I want to say is that we all stand here today together in solidarity uh, with, with, um, with Ukraine. It's a very, very important for all of us to, to do that. And I just move straight away uh, to talk to, um, to Henrik. So, Henrik, um, if I can maybe open up with you, and I just want to maybe mention two things to you. First of all, maybe you could give us a kind of um, an overview of the effect of the sanctions, in your view, on Russian aviation, how things are working out with the leasers and any safety issues and anything else you'd like to add in. But, you know, I think the viewers will be very interested in, in these topics. So over to you, Henrik. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eamon, and uh, thank you for um, having me here. I think um, uh, to start, um, uh, of course, uh, most important is to uh, observe the situation on the ground in Ukraine. It is the 30th day of the invasion of uh, Ukraine and the aggression of uh, Russian murderous regime against Ukraine. And uh, of course, uh, we all, our heart is beating with the Ukrainians and uh, we are also uh, very, very amazed about the bravery that we have seen by the Ukrainian people. And also, let's not forget that uh, what they are doing there, they are not only fighting for the freedom of their own country, but they are also fighting for the freedom of us and anyone who uh, shares the same values, the existence of the West. And of course, also, all this war has brought the West together in a way that we haven't seen over the last uh, decades. And of course, uh, that has also uh, resulted in the actions uh, by the West. The uh, European Union has taken the lead here and also it uh, laid down the, the sanctions uh, uh, right after the uh, different actions that were uh, done by the by the Russian uh, Federation and, uh, and of course, uh, following first the recognition of the two uh, occupied regions and then, of course, the uh, aggression uh, itself. And aviation has been uh, put in the forefront of, uh, of those uh, sanctions. It was part of the second uh, sanctions package. And, uh, and I think that what we have also observed now, uh, uh, almost 30 days later, is that these sanctions have been incredibly efficient. It has brought uh, Russian civil aviation back 30 years. 
idea to say that we have been destroying Russian fed, uh, um, civil aviation, which has been the whole idea of the sanctions. And those people who think that the sanctions are necessarily the tools uh, to bring a change in the regime's behavior, then uh, I would say that that's not the case. Sanctions are predominantly also a punishment measure. And uh, I think that uh, every sanction that has been for the moment adopted also has a very clear meaning and also is serving its purpose. In aviation, that has meant, of course, that uh, uh, we have stopped uh, providing any kind of uh, products, we have stopped providing any kind of uh, services, and Eamon already in his introductory remarks uh, covered that uh, extremely well. Also, uh, the first uh, batch of the aviation sanctions was followed by the airspace closure, and uh, we are grateful that the United States, though a few days later, and Canada as well, uh, have followed suit and, of course, uh, have shown the unity which is needed in this context. But let's also not forget that there are a number of countries also in Asia who might have not uh, uh, adopted the airspace closure sanctions, but whose airlines have stopped uh, flying over the Russian airspace uh, for safety reasons as well. And this has been prolonged, and I'm sure that this is also going to be prolonged further. So we can see that the uh, like-minded countries around the globe also have been helping us to, uh, 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 to um, apply these sanctions and to make sure that they are going to have a very uh, strong effect. So for the Russian civil aviation, as Eamon was also putting it, th they cannot uh, fly anywhere. Uh, because um, uh, they don't have actually that many aircraft uh, to fly with. Uh, the aircraft that they could fly with, Suhoi Superjet, uh, well, we know that it is an aircraft which is not uh, owned by any of the European airlines. It is not, uh, it's not a great aircraft, and those European airlines which used to use it uh, have taken it out of the service. Uh, uh, but uh, most of the other aircraft that they could fly abroad are the aircraft which uh, have been leased, which are either American or uh, European origin, and which which now uh, they have stolen uh, from their rightful owners, the lessers. And of course, uh, this has also been a very interesting development. We are following every aircraft which flies into the third country jurisdiction. We are working with the authorities in these countries, but also in the European Union and with our partners. And we have been also very successful in being able to repossess these aircrafts. I'm very grateful for the third country authorities who have taken the necessary steps uh, in order to ground these aircrafts and who have then allowed also the rightful owners to repossess them and uh, take them back. So even with those jurisdictions, jurisdictions where Russian airlines could fly, they don't fly anymore because uh, uh, they have the possible uh, action that can take place and, and then they would also uh, lose these aircraft which they anyway have stolen and when they have been re-registered uh, they have been gravely violating the international air law and they have also been gravely violating the basic act of the civil aviation, the Chicago Convention. So what kind of um, implications does it have? Obviously, every sanction has implications on both sides. There are also implications on the European side. The implications have, of course, been that uh, we can't fly to Russia. Russia has never been a very significant market for European Union, but again, now when we are coming out from the COVID crisis and the aviation is recovering, every market counts. Secondly, of course, providing of services. We have also, different European companies have also provided services, MRO services, uh, uh, technical support, and, um, and of course, uh, this is not possible anymore. I'm not talking about the lessers we already talked about, but of course, more than 520 planes have were leased by Russian airlines from the lessers, which are domiciled in the European Union, predominantly in Ireland. So all these kind of services are not there anymore. This has been also... Uh, quite a big market, especially for the lessers, but also for the other service providers. So this market is off. Secondly, the Siberian overflights are off. Uh, different airlines, of course, have different effects, but there are certain airlines which are hugely impacted. I feel extremely sorry for Finnair, great airline, great strategy, but uh, of course, uh, their strategy was very much based on the uninterrupted overflights of the, Siberian terri uh, of the Russian territory of Siberia to Asia. And of course, that was their competitive advantage. And today, unfortunately, this is not possible and it adds many operational complexities and additional costs. But they are not only. Most of the long-haul European airlines are impacted who were flying to Asia. And Asia has been historically also an important market for Europe. Yes, we don't see the effect today because Asia has been largely closed because of the COVID. 
but uh, once this is going to open up, uh, we see how much additional traffic there could have been, and which is not going to happen because of these kind of complexities that we are currently facing. And there are many other things which, of course, come into picture. I mean, directly coming from the aggression, and Damon had already this chart, Ukraine was a very promising market. We signed the aviation agreement with Ukraine just a few months ago. The next day, Ryanair, Wizzair, started to operate in this market. Even a few days before the Russian aggression, Ryanair had 50 flights per day. We had something like 30 flights per day. And uh, they were growing this. Uh, and they saw this as a potential market for this summer and beyond. So this is also now uh, dropping off. And, and, and of course, the reroutings, and I'm sure we will talk about that, will also add additional problems related to the congestion and, 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 and of course, uh, uh, related to the service delivery uh, for, the, for the air navigation. And I think that what we also need to see that uh, those who are going to have the biggest impact are the hub carriers. And uh, this is also clear that we have to be attentive to their concern and, uh, and try to do whatever we can. But the bottom line, of course, is that uh, our sanctions are working. We pay a price for that as well, but this price is nothing compared to the price which is paid by the Ukraine and which is paid by the Ukrainian people. So I think we are on the right track, but of course we need to work very much together. We need to minimize the impact, and I think that this is also something that uh, we can find ways how to do that. Okay, Henrik, thanks very much. That was a really very, very good introduction and an overview of the sanctions. So if we can move now to uh, Warsaw, to Rafael. Rafael, Maybe you could give, a, give us your perspective, maybe from two aspects. One, how as an airline are you managing and coping with the um, Ukraine situation, especially now coming out of COVID? And secondly, what's your general perspective on um, the whole issue and how do we actually get out of this and what happens? And from an aviation point of view, you were formerly on the board of IATA, so you've got a broad knowledge of aviation. Maybe you could give us um, some thoughts on how, how you see things. So over to you, Rafael. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Eamon. Yes, well, first of all, I would like to start by, by extending my great support on behalf of myself, Lot Polish Airlines Board and all, the, all our employees, uh, to all the Ukrainian people um, and also to all the employees of Ukrainian International. Uh, we are trying to help and they, they know this very well. We are employing them. We are providing shelter and everything else. By now, over 2 million refugees have crossed the Polish border and, and we are doing our utmost to provide uh, shelter and to provide conditions for survival uh, because they are the most vulnerable people. They are mothers uh, with children um, because the men are staying behind in Ukraine for, to fight for their and our freedom. But I would also like to extend a few words to all my Russian friends. I will not be na naming them. Uh, but I, I know that it is a very difficult situation for all of you. Uh, and also to my Belarusian friends from, from Belavia and Russian friends from Maralovlov, I know there is a lot of people in Russia who do not support uh, this criminal war on innocent people of Ukraine. Uh, and I just want you to understand that we are not thinking in very black and white terms. And we know and we understand uh, that there are good people whose hearts go out to the poor Ukrainian people that are being now slaughtered and murdered. Um, and, and, it's, and it's just very, very tragic that we all find ourselves in this situation. Ladies and gentlemen, aviation needs peace. Without peace, aviation just cannot work. And it's as simple as, simple as that. Uh, what this conflict, what this war has caused for us is very tragic. Uh, not only we have the Russian airspace closed, the Belarus uh, airspace was closed as a result of, uh, of the um, Ryanair incident and kidnapping of two people uh, of the Ryanair flight by the Belarusian regime. Um, and now, of course, we can't fly over Ukraine. Uh, we could not fly to and over Moldova for a long time. So all of this causes a huge impact. But if that were not enough, we also cannot fly over certain, uh, certain parts of the Polish airspace because they are in heavy, heavy military use. And uh, I would like to say that PANSA, our national um, uh, ANSP provider, uh, is under, I would say, a very particular challenge. And they are, I think, coping very well because they are maintaining regular commercial traffic while also 
providing amazing service for all the NATO uh, forces, uh, and they are doing this and they are doing this successfully. But what this means for us is that we also have to avoid certain parts of the Polish territory. And what that means, you know, on long haul flights, for example, going to the Far East uh, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a full turnaround, it's probably four and a half to five hours longer flight. Uh, and that's and that's absolutely tragic. Um, we had to. So, I mean, in, in total, about 13 percent of our flights had to be rescheduled because of all these uh, differences, because of the of the changes in the operational patterns required. About 9% of our flights had to be cancelled uh, because we used to fly to Russia regularly, to, to Ukraine regularly. We also flew to Moldova. And, you know, obviously we flew, we were also flying to, to, to Minsk in Belarus. And now none of these flights uh, can be operated. Um, and I think it's horrible. It's, it's, it's heartbreaking because aviation, I very strongly believe, is the industry that brings about peace and friendship between people. And, when, and with, with it being disrupted, there is even more uh, lack of trust and even more conflict potentially boiling uh, in the air. But that's, um, that's the unfortunate, uh, that's the unfortunate, unfortunate impact. Um, some flights are no longer possible because we can't fly with the, tra with the airplane type that we, that we used to fly. Uh, and of course, you have all the economic impacts. So um, uh, this war has fu fundamentally raised fuel prices. Um, and now when we combine fuel prices with extremely high levels of EU ETS certificates, uh, this is providing uh, such a huge negative impact on all the operators, all the European operators, then I think it really calls for a rethink um, and perhaps a memorandum for a period of time uh, on the application of EU ETS onto European aviation, uh, because uh, frankly we are we are under huge uh, financial stress and we haven't yet got uh, gotten out of COVID. Uh, and I really think the European Commission uh, should very 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 seriously consider that, uh, because the fuel prices are are, are sufficient to. Uh, to, to guarantee that we will, that we will be flying with economically viable and, and environmentally viable uh, aircraft. Then, of course, the passenger demand is reduced because if you have an imminent war actually happening just behind our border with rockets sometimes landing uh, as close as 30, 30 kilometers to the Polish border, our Polish customer uh, base uh, feels reluctant to leave home. And I, I really understand why they have families here. So the overall, the propensity, uh, the propensity to fly of various people um, is fundamentally, uh, uh, fundamentally reduced. And then, of course, all the all the mess that is caused on the exchange rates and all the other economic parameters. And okay. I think, you know, from this from all this negative, there has to be something positive that must be born. And what I would call for is um, uh, European aviation solidarity. I think if we if we if we look upon the energy solidarity and what happened in the energy market uh, with building of uh, of pipelines that avoided Ukraine, that avoided the Baltic states, that avoided, avoided Poland, that was a fundamental mistake. And this is where the concept of European solidarity, in that case European energy solidarity, fundamentally failed. And I think to a very significant degree, those failed uh, decisions that were that were taken because of economic interests of a particular country and not of Europe as a whole, have fed this dragon that is now attacking an innocent country and killing innocent people. Uh, and what I mean by European aviation solidarity is I really think we need to start acting as Europe and not engage in bilateral discussions you know, there will come a moment, I very much hope, when Russia stops this invasion and withdraws its forces. I really am praying for that every day. Okay, Rafael, uh, that's that. And, and I think, and I think what, what should happen is, is when we try to go back to normalcy, we really should, we, should, we really should come back to the, uh, to the um, uh, agreed principles that was 
uh, that was a document, a fundamental document, fundamental achievement of the European Union that was supposed to specify and clarify how the EU carriers will work with Russia. Okay. So that there is no discrimination uh, between European carriers and, say, Chinese carriers, and also no discrimination between uh, between Euro European carriers themselves when it comes to access to the, Euro to the Euro Russian airspace. Okay, Rafael. So listen, we'll pick those points up with Henrik in, in a moment. So can we move to Helsinki? Thank you, uh, Rafael. Really good point. So if we move to Rene, Rene is the chairman of the Council European um, CEOs Committee. So Rene, uh, I see that, for instance, um, you know, in Helsinki ACC, you're minus 15%. What's the impact of this crisis on air navigation service providers in Europe? Maybe you can quickly let me know what you think. Thank you, Imun, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. So first, first of all, I, I, I want to say that my thoughts are, of course, with the Ukrainian people who are now fighting against the Russia. And, and I, I also think that they are fighting for European values and, and uh, uh, for democracy also. So this is, this is what, what, what I, I, my, my main, main thoughts are at the moment. But when it comes to the to aviation sector and uh, what is, uh, how this crisis uh, is affecting to the air navigation service providers, uh, we, we have to remember that two years ago, uh, almost uh, 24 uh, months ago, uh, pandemic started and, and uh, uh, we, we, we have seen that uh, there was a huge collapse in, in a whole, whole aviation sector. So, so we have had very, uh, two very bad uh, years behind us already. And now, now we have this, uh, this uh, Russian invasion to the Ukraine. And, and all the sanctions are affecting to the ANSPs very heavily. And but like like Iman, you mentioned in your introductory that uh, traffic flows have uh, very much changed in whole Europe, uh, especially those countries who are close to the war zone or those countries who are <laughs> close to the Russian border, like like Finland. So so the, we have seen when it comes to the ANSPs, the situation has led to increase in the number of some, uh, some uh, overflights in some countries, and some of which have fallen sharply. And uh, when it comes to Finland, for example, you mentioned that uh, we have lost quite many overflights because, uh, because uh, Western Europe airlines are not able to fly to the Asia via, uh, via Russian airspace and vice versa. So many ANSPs are suffering and, and are losing uh, lots of money at the moment. So the biggest question, of course, is now that how air carriers, airspace users, and air navigation services providers are coping with this new crisis. And, and we have to remember that, for example, uh, air navigation service providers, we need to cover our cost and expenses in order to maintain uh, safe and, and continuous uh, air navigation services 24-7 uh, and every, every day in, in a year. Okay, Rene, thank you very, very much. And uh, that kind of gives us a kind of a broad picture from the NSP. So if I can swing back to you, Henrik, um, and I'm trying to kind of capture everything that everybody said and, and um, put all the hard questions to you. So starting off, I mean, the whole issue of aviation solidarity, the issue of um, what I would say sustainability, which is the Fit for 55 agenda. There are a number of people say, look, this is a crisis. Fuel prices are now at 140 a barrel. So we're under a little bit of pressure. So I'm sure that this is going to be on your agenda going forward. And also the issue of safety. And what I mean by that is like, how safe are these airlines that, that, that are now operating in Russia? Should people be using Russian airspace that are even non-European from an, an ICAO point of view? And of course, the issues of the leasers, you know, what's the next um, steps and what can happen? So kind of four difficult questions. And we start off with the sustainability one. I know it's one you probably would like to dodge, but we have you here, so let's try and do it. No, no, not at all. I mean, uh, I think that uh, we need to see the the crisis uh, all over, and uh, and 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 of course it uh, it affects uh, many aspects. But uh, uh, I think uh, on that one, I would also say that uh, we haven't talked enough about uh, uh, what is also positive in aviation, and uh, and 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 the positive thing I think, and uh, I'm sure that Damon, you can also uh, in your forecast uh, uh, see that, which is that uh, this spring and this summer. Uh, looks still, despite of all this, relatively positive when it comes to intra-European traffic. And I think there is a very, very uh, positive uh, uh, forecast when it comes to the transatlantic traffic, uh, especially when uh, both sides would also be able to get rid of the um, 
uh, the restrictions uh, and uh, and especially the US from the uh, uh, pre-departure clearance, uh, uh, pre-departure tests. So uh, I think that we are going to see a, a lot of vibrancy in the transatlantic market, which also means that there is going to be a lot of flights. And when I look at your current forecast as well, then we are about 75% of uh, uh, 2019, which also means that we are actually moving onwards and uh, we are continuing to um, uh, emit the CO2 and uh, we will continuously need to focus on the sustainability issues. So even though there are new challenges, it doesn't mean that the old challenges are going to disappear. And making aviation more sustainable is definitely one of those challenges. As well as, by the way, to be ready to deal uh, with the capacity crunch, which is going to be present uh, in the air and also on the ground. But this is not a topic for today. So, so my point is that uh, I don't think that we can draw any long-reaching conclusions out of the first uh, 30 days. And uh, definitely not the moment uh, when, uh, when we can sort of talk about uh, giving any kind of flexibility when it comes to the drive towards more sustainability in the aviation. When we look at the fuel price, for example, then this fuel price is not the price for Europe. Fuel price is a price for the whole world, and everybody pays the same. When I look at, for example, US, they are running already in 90% of the 2019, soon be over uh, the 2019, so pre-COVID uh, levels in terms of flights. So, so there are more flights in the, in the airspace. Uh, everybody is ready to pay, and, uh, and, and I don't think that this is a moment we can do these kind of uh, uh, adjustments only if we would have some longer term uh, um, uh, data which, which, which can confirm it, but I don't think we are there and I don't think that in any way we can make any kind of concessions when it comes to the drive towards more sustainability in aviation. But I want to say one thing about solidarity. Solidarity is very important. We have seen incredible solidarity among the European transport operators, including the airlines. I mean, about uh, uh, rail sector, bus sector, they have all been uh, giving people free passes. Also, the airline sector has helped a lot. And I want to thank each and everyone who has been contributing to that. This is the real display of solidarity. But there are also those who are trying to undercut and who are trying to make the use of this situation. I find it not only being uh, not solidaire, but I find it absolutely outrageous that, for example, uh, Turkish uh, uh, operators have increased their flights to Russia 80% after the from, compared to when the crisis started. I think this is a kind of solidarity uh, uh, that uh, we are not we are not in any way in agreement. And also, this is something uh, 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 that you wouldn't expect from a country which is also the member of European Aviation Cooperation and also a European Union candidate country and a NATO member. So I think that there are also this kind of very very negative uh, uh, examples. Uh, which uh, do not, uh, uh, unfortunately, belong to the European understanding of solidarity. And we should also draw our own conclusions out of that. Thanks, Henrik. Um, Henrik, maybe if I could just do a follow-on question with you. How long, I mean, this is really a, a difficult question, but assuming there's a treaty or assuming something happens, how long will these sanctions last? I mean, just for people planning, you know, MROs, are we looking at years? Are we looking at decades? I mean, Cuba has gone on for 60 years. I mean... Is this just crystal ball stuff? What do you think? Iran has gone on 40 years. Yeah. And then what was a moment when we had a bit of a lifting of the sanctions. And hopefully there is another moment today because I really hope that this helps. But uh, as somebody who uh, in 2014 was uh, coordinating uh, uh, the work uh, uh, on the sanctions uh, against Russia after the uh, illegal uh, um, annexation of Crimea and also after the aggression to Donetsk, uh, Donetsk and Luhansk region, then uh, the same sanctions that we put in place in 2014 are still in place today, and okay. they have been constantly rolled over. I don't think that anything that is going to be uh, fundamentally different uh, will also happen to this patch of sanctions. And uh, we also don't see that there is going to be any, uh, let's say, uh, quick resolution uh, to this aggression. Uh, I think this is not for me to say. This is obviously for the leaders to say, and they are the ones who decide on the sanctions, uh, and they are also the ones who will decide if the sanctions are lifted. But at least based on the experience we have had in the past, this is definitely, as you also, Eamon, had in your slide, this is a long haul. This is not a, a long haul issue. OK, Henrik, thanks. Raphael, can I go back to, to Warsaw? I've, I've got a really specific question for you. So tell me about this summer. Do you think fares are going to go up generally in Europe? You know, I'm looking at a very good summer in the offering. Air traffic control delays even coming back in some parts of Europe. What's your feeling about fares for the next year or so? Maybe give us some impact. We have a lot of people watching us here today and maybe some of them are planning holidays. So maybe to get highly specific with Lot, how are you doing? 
Well, we, we adjust to market conditions and unfortunately, I wish we were we were running at full capacity. We are not, you know, we haven't yet come out of COVID uh, and we were hit with this horrible crisis and we are probably, apart from Ukrainian international, uh, who is unjustly completely forced to stop operations, um, we are probably one of the hardest hit. By the way, our fly, uh, over flights is 33% down. Uh, that's, that's the numbers for Panza. Uh, and our traffic, um, I don't expect to be, unless this conflict finishes before the summer, I'm not expecting a good summer uh, at all. Because, because uh, really, I mean, you have to, I have to share with you what, what the feeling of the place is. I mean, we, we literally have uh, Ukrainian people all over in Poland and we are trying to help them, give them shelter, take them into our homes and everything. And it's, uh, you know, and uh, quite frankly, a lot of people are also giving up uh, some of their income in order to help, you know, to, to go out and help uh, and help other people. And if there is a war, I don't think people want to uh, want to leave their homes and leave their close ones uh, to go for holiday. So okay. we actually see we, we actually see a drop um, uh, because of the conflict. Uh, I hope that the, the situation is going to stabilize and we we can see some stabilization after about two, three weeks of the conflict. There are some signs that per cap, per, per, perhaps people are adjusting. But I think overall, I'm not expe expecting a great summer. Uh, the, 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 the prices, I think, will inevitably go down for, for a variety of reasons. First of all, overall inflation. In, in Europe and in Poland, actually in the US, everywhere, we are facing inflation. And, that's, uh, and that is somewhat, somewhat to do with this conflict because of the rising energy prices. Uh, but it's, there, there are also fundamental reasons why, the, why this inflation is there. And the reasons are very loose monetary policy over, over the last okay. uh, several years. R uh, Rafael, additionally, yeah. additionally, we have all the, all, the, all the costs elements. So we must increase the prices. Uh, because you know, if we pay one thousand four hundred dollars per uh, per ton of aviation fuel, that has to get reflected in the price, and the price must differ to when av aviation fuel was seven hundred dollars. Okay, uh, Rafael, I, I've got a follow up question for you, and maybe you might take it if you can as fast as you can. With the Russian Federation airspace closed and all of the closures, will you be looking at the composition of your fleet? how it's done in the mix of long haul and short haul. Do you see yourself looking at, at the way the business is structured? Will it have fundamental change aspects for you and Lot? Obviously, we have to take it into account. But actually, we have, because of COVID, we have adjusted in the way we do, do business. You know, the hub didn't really operate for definitely a year and a half or something. We, we only started rebuilding the hub operation. Uh, in fact, I mean, we, we, we were expecting that the proper hub operations would start in April 2022. Okay. <laughs> so we're still not there, but actually we we have used our long haul uh, long haul airplanes to uh, to fly a lot of charter flights uh, from a number of locations, not only from Poland. Uh, so you know we are we are a very agile company, and I think uh, you know ultimately we want to be a hub carrier for Central Europe. We want to be number one hub carrier for Central Europe. And that will uh, require a, a, a fleet mix of wide bodies and, uh, and narrow bodies. We are constantly, as, as Henrik is expecting, and according to the expectations of the European policy on that, we are modernizing our fleet all the time. You know, we, we've invested in new modern aviation technology and will continue doing so. And I, would, uh, and I would argue, Henrik, that we don't really need additional administrative payments in order to do that, because that is that has been the intuition uh, and the actions of every single CEO of every single company in Europe, and I don't think there's there's going back. Okay. So I would say actually the EU ETS can be scrapped. Okay. For at least for the period <laughs> of the of the company. Okay, Rafael, your point is well made. You nailed it twice there, so well well done. So Rene, if I can just turn to you for a minute, maybe you could give us a feeling for how how has this crisis been perceived in Helsinki? I mean, I see Finnair are majorly impacted, but generally, what's the general feeling from Helsinki? 
Yeah, of course, we are a little bit afraid of the war also. And perhaps you have heard uh, that, that there is an ongoing discussion in the Finnish government whether we should join NATO or not. This is, this is one, one big, big uh, thing for, for whole Finnish people. But when it comes to the uh, air traffic, uh, I think that uh, what, what we think about at the moment, we, we have now seen that uh, Finnair has started uh, flying to Japan via North Pole, and we just received information from uh, Japan that Japan Airlines will also commence their flights back to Helsinki via North Pole, which is a good thing. And, and, uh, and uh, we also think that uh, this uh, traveling is increasing during summertime. So, so we have a quite uh, positive look to the, to the, when it comes to the traffic numbers, when it comes to the Europe. But uh, of course, uh, like, like uh, you mentioned that Finnair is one, one of the most affected airline who is suffering most that, that because they can't fly direct flights to, to over, over or short flight shortest route to, to the uh, Japan, they, they need to find uh, uh, new routes. For example, now they are uh, starting the new routes for the North America. So, so they are trying to utilize, of course, because they have a quite uh, huge or quite many uh, long haul and wide body aircrafts, they, they want to, to keep them on, on the skies. Uh, so, so, but then, then, then we have some other problems in, in our space. Uh, but you, you perhaps uh, mentioned already that uh, now when, when, uh, when Russian airlines, they are not able to fly directly uh, to the Kaliningrad, they are now, uh, instead of that, that they are flying uh, between mainland Russia and Kaliningrad and vice versa above the Gulf of Finland, where we have a very narrow section of international airspace between Finland and Estonia. And, and uh, we, have, we have seen that there, there are, on best days, we have seen 50 of those flights between, between mainland and, and Bain Russia and Kaliningrad. And it is, uh, it is not, it is not uh, easy for our air traffic controllers because uh, it is very different what we have seen earlier. And, and uh, at the, uh, when they are flying on, onto that very narrow corridor, we have quite a lot of uh, traffic between Europe okay. and, and Helsinki and uh, crossing at the same same not that perhaps not at the same levels but uh, crossing the this gulf of uh, finland and it is it is not very nice but uh, unfortunately uh, unfortunately we have not seen serious incidents yet so so okay, we that's, are a little bit worried that that's pretty good Rene. so henrik i have um two questions kind of coming in on the the wire so i'll try and summarize them the first one is probably one again is when we have you here is what are you going to do about slots for the summer given the reduction in the traffic for this summer and next summer, and what generally are, are, you, are you looking at? And the second question is, um, if matters escalate further, do you foresee further sanctions or what else can aviation do to assist uh, Ukraine? So there are two questions, slots, escalation. I mean, I start from the second one uh, because, uh, uh, I mean, anything is possible. I mean, we have seen this uh, this war unfolding. Uh, uh, we have also seen uh, certainly some kind of status quo, but at the same time, there are continuous bombing of civilian uh, targets. Uh, it is uh, it is deliberate uh, uh, hospital schools, uh, uh, and uh, and of course, it is entirely unacceptable. We don't know how far it is going to go, and of course, if it uh, if it goes further, then this is a question uh, not for me but it is a question again for our leaders uh, because they are the ones who decide uh, uh, which kind of sanctions and when uh, to uh, to deploy i mean surely there is a, a wide range of possibilities of different sanctions but uh, which ones are, are going to be used and if they are going to be used is not a decision that uh, uh, is made at my level uh, secondly, uh, concerning the slots, I think uh, it is uh, it is pretty clear what uh, what we what are the expectations for summer. I think uh, we have indicated that uh, uh, we would um, uh, expect uh, the uh, the slot usage uh, to be uh, 64, mm -hmm. and at the same time also to have the JNUS, so the justified uh, non-use of the slots, uh, and, and and further guidance on this. Uh, as far as we have been looking into it with our experts, uh, this uh, should cover also what is currently 
directly related uh, to the uh, uh, to the aggression and also the spillovers uh, from that and uh, working with the slot coordinators and making sure that these effects uh, which are done uh, from the from the war point of view uh, will be fully taken into account should allow us also to make sure that um, uh, the the slots are used uh, efficiently but at the same time leaving also sufficient flexibility uh, for the airlines so so I think this is generally uh, being accepted we have also uh, had uh, positive feedback for example from Ayata from uh, many of the of the airlines and I think that we have been on the on the right track in in, in finding that uh, way forward thanks Henrik that was a, a good summary Rafael if you could, I'm going to ask you a kind of a question. So in, in one minute, because we're coming near the end of the, of the broadcast, could you maybe summarise for us what's your hope for the future in this whole crisis? My hope is that there is peace, imminent peace, because people are dying and we need to, we need to end this. And my hope is when we come back to normalcy, that Europe will show solidarity. It will show solidarity and wisdom between the European carriers that we will not allow when we go back to normalcy with Russia to discriminate against one country and promote another, to discriminate against one carrier and promote another, mm -hmm. that we will make sure and safeguard the interests of European air carriers versus, for example, Chinese or other air carriers, uh, because uh, Chinese air carriers don't pay any royalties on the Trans-Siberian flights. And European air carriers pay a lot of royalties uh, on the Trans-Siberian air, uh, air, air flights. And I really am also hoping for, for another look by the European Commission and by the European Union on various European Union policies. Because I have to say, we have to stop being naive when we are discriminating against, against our own operators, imposing burdens on them that cannot possibly be carried. And, you know, here is definitely EU ETS, but there is also a, a lot of uh, other issues and they need to be looked upon. And I think Fit for 55 is definitely something that will have to be fundamentally reviewed. Okay, because right. It sounds nice, it sounds nice, <laughs> but it's extremely idealistic and I'm afraid it's going to kill a number of air cars. Oh, okay, Rafael, um, I, you got a third punch in there. So well done. This, you're very close to a knockout on Henrik and ETS, but I'll come back to him in a minute. So, Rene, um, how do you think... Um, uh, ANS will will react over the over the busy summer months. And just give me one minute. Tell me, are you are you up for a very busy summer um, for the ANSPs in Europe? And are you going to make sure we don't have too much delays? Yeah, I, I hope that there will be no no delays. But of course, uh, some some of my colleagues they they have been saying that uh, it is a good sign if there are uh, delays, then there are also some traffic. But uh, I think that all ANSPs in Europe are very well prepared uh, to to. To, to to handle it and they try to do their best so that uh, that there will, would be no no delays and and uh, people can start traveling and they get the trust that that, that uh, there is a punctuality in in, in a, uh, airspace also thank you thank you Rene. okay so henrik we'll just circle back to you for a last time and give you a kind of like a a 90 second closing remark and then I'll, I'll wrap up because, you know, you've been punching, uh, Raphael has been punching you all day about ETS and, um, you know, so he's hit you three times now. So maybe you might deal with the issue, number one, and then number two, uh, how do you think we, we deal with the going forward in the future? So, Henrik. Thanks. I I know Raphael very well, and I have a <laughs> profound respect and friendship with him. Uh, so do I, so do I, Henrik. <laughs> and it doesn't matter that uh, we can see on everything eye to eye, and I've punched back as well on the ETS, but I don't think that there is one thing I, I don't think that we should be talking about, and this is even when the time of the crisis, we need to talk about the sustainability of aviation. This is for the aviation. And this is also for the, for the globe more generally. But the thing is that if we are not able to make aviation more sustainable, we will not have a license to grow. I want to see aviation growing, but I also want to see the emissions going down. And ETS is one of the very good market-based tools that allows us to do that. But we can have another time, another discussion. I'm sure Eamon will be happy to have that. But yeah. where I'm fully in agreement also with you, Raphael, and I'm sorry I didn't reply before, is, of course, in relation to the Siberian overflights. You're absolutely right. We have three times we have a Agreed. I have been myself two times there when this agreement has been made and every time our Russian partners uh, decided uh, not to follow that agreement. It doesn't come as a surprise to me, but I think maybe for some. Uh, my point is that 
if ever we will be in the situation where there will be some rolling back of the sanctions, I don't think that uh, uh, we should not then use the opportunity to make sure that we will be able to settle for once and for all the Siberian overflights. Okay. The way Russia has behaving there is also discriminatory, and I'm fully in agreement with you. This needs to stop in the future. OK, so what you're saying to me, Henrik, in a summary, to summarise Henrik's remarks, I'll try and do it, is building back better. OK, so... Guys, I want to thank you very much for, for participating today. Rene in Helsinki, thank you on behalf of the, the ANSPs. I think uh, it's good to see everybody uh, here, here on this. And I, I think, Raphael, thank you from um, Warsaw and giving us a, a very, very good view. And, and um, we'll see how you get on with your ETS scheme going forward uh, as things go. Henrik, thank you for joining me here at Europe Control in Brussels. And all our listeners and everybody who views this, I really appreciate the fact that you tuned in today. This is a very tricky topic. Everybody here in this room is in full solidarity with Ukraine. We deplore the uh, whole violence and the aggression that's been waged on the Ukrainian people. And we have to all act in solidarity. But I think the point that uh, we we'll take is we've got to build back better, learn from this and hopefully move forward in a more positive way. So that's it from Eurocontrol today. Thank you very much. Thank you. God bless.